Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library and Museum. We're really excited to have you all here for what I think is going to be a, a wonderful night. I want to do a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we do a wonderful author program, and one of the, on a blue skirted table out in the lobby, we have a couple of flyers that I think are going to interest you. One looks like this, and it talks about upcoming authors that, that we've got coming. Uh, and some, you know, if you're getting ready for the holidays uh, on the 27th, the uh, floral director from the White House is going to be here to talk about how they did that. Uh, uh, Bill Browder, who uh, uh, has been in the news a lot lately since uh, Putin uh, put him on a watch list, and there was a question about him getting a visa back because he's been a, a critic. But there's some, some really good ones. Uh, Co-founder of uh, Black Lives Matters is... Uh, coming in January. So those are all ones that I think you're going to want to, uh, to come to. Uh, and then there's, there's another guy that's having a book signing here uh, on December 4th. His name is pretty much all around this uh, complex. Uh, President Carter is going to be signing his new book, The Craftsmanship of Jimmy Carter, as well as all of the other books that he has authored. And there's a, there's a sheet out there as well that uh, talks about the uh, the requirements, how, how we're going to do it in the time and, and all of that. But tonight, tonight is, is all about looking at ourselves and looking at America and what we, we stand for by, it, you know, it, it's interesting because we're, we're going to learn a lot about ourselves from someone who was not born in this country, uh, someone who has seen us from the the outside and now the inside and can give us a, uh, a good look at ourselves. Kizer Khan uh, immigrated here from Pakistan. He is a gold star father. Uh, he is an, an attorney. Uh, and I think we all came to know him at the, uh, the Democratic Convention. Sumaya Khalifa is the executive director of the Islamic Speakers Bureau here in Atlanta. She will be in conversation with him tonight, so I know it's going to be a, a wonderful conversation. And, you know, the thing that I think of when I think of Kizer Khan is him standing at the Democratic Convention, holding up the Constitution of the United States, and making us think about what it stands for. So please join me in welcoming Sumaya Khalifa and Kizer Khan. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Carter Center. Mr. Khan, welcome to Atlanta. Well, thank you. We're so thank honored you. and privileged to have you here tonight. I am honored. Thank you. I thank have to you. tell you, the first that most of us, including myself, have heard about you was when you spoke out at the Democratic National Convention. I remember I was teaching a class that night, and during break, I checked my phone, and everybody texted me, called me, turn on the TV, you got to listen to Mr. Kizer Khan and see Mrs. Ghazala Khan at the Democratic National Convention. You were speaking on behalf of so many people, and you made us so very proud. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we, we spoke on behalf of all of us and uh, the goodness of this country and the good values that we have been privilege to, to enjoy and cherish. So we spoke on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thanks. Um, making the decision to speak at the Democratic National Convention, can you walk us through what happened? Was that an easy decision when you were approached and you said, okay, I'm going to do it? Or what went behind the scenes in your household? Sure. Uh, in December of uh, before I, 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 we start our conversation, I want to, uh, if there are any veterans in the audience, I want to pay tribute to your service 
thank you for serving the United States and this nation and the families of men and women serving in uniform today and our members of the law enforcement. Thank you for protecting us, keeping us safe. We are grateful to you and to your families. Thank you. Um, in, in December 2015, all of these stories are in the book in detail, but uh, uh, just to, to share uh, in brief, in 2015 of uh, December, uh, this nation's election history's most bigoted statement was made. Uh, if I am elected president, I will ban all Muslims. Hispanics will be thrown out of United States. They are criminals. Women are not of equal dignity. Judges are partial, and so on. Uh, we watch that statement. Some of our family members, their friends, and family at large, I come from Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia, a city of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, wherever we would go to visit our families, their small children, middle school, elementary school kids would uh, reach out to me knowing that I practice law, and they would ask this question, uh, are we going to be thrown out of here if this candidate is elected president? Uh, but we are born here. We don't know any other place. And this wasn't just the Muslim children, uh, children of all faiths and uh, uh, all color and uh, all backgrounds. We are born here. Our parents are born here. But when we go to school, uh, our classmates bully us and they tell us, oh, you will be thrown out of this country. Uh, so I would hearten them, I would hug them, and I would tell them, and I would pull out the Constitution that I had been keeping in my pocket since 2005. That's a separate story how it uh, uh, started in my pocket, in my coat pockets. Uh, so I would pull it out and read it to them. See, here it is written that we are of equal dignity, of equal rights, and equal protection. No one can throw us out of this country. Children would be heartened momentarily, but then their parents will say to me uh, after I would call, or they would call, that we want you to speak to our children one more time. They are not eating properly. They are worried. Uh, some of them refuse to go to school, saying that uh, our classmates tell us that uh, when you go back to, from school to home, your parents would have been taken you would never see them again. And uh, so they don't want to go to school. Every morning they have tummy ache. Uh, we are sick, we don't want to go to school. So this was taking place in our personal life. In January came a telephone call from DNC that uh, prior to then uh, there was a newspaper writer uh, a digital media person from New York called me and said, Mr. Khan, you heard that statement about Muslims in the United States. Uh, what are your thoughts? I chatted with him for 10, 15 minutes, and uh, he published that article. That article was read by DNC folks, and uh, uh, they called that we have read your article, your statements. Uh, we are planning to pay tribute to our Gold Star uh, members of the armed forces. Several other families are also being invited. Uh, would you like to come? I said, uh, let me think about it. Give us a couple of days. So they said, uh, sure, but let us know. The schedule is very crowded. Uh, so immediately I called our other two sons, asking them, uh, what do you think? We have this invitation to go to DNC convention. And they told us, do not go. Such events are so political that your peace, your privacy, your dignity, everything will be maligned uh, by those who are on the other side of the aisle. Uh, it's, that's how these things are conducted. And you're not that sort of people, so just decline. I thought they are being overprotective of us. So I called a couple of other friends, 
in public and asked them, uh, we have this invitation to come and speak at DNC, should we go? They are paying tribute to Captain Himayun Khan. And they told us exactly the same thing, what our sons have said, do not go. This is not, you're not that type of people. You're private, humble, modest, stay home and just let them pay tribute to Captain Himayun Khan and do not participate. So we sat uh, in the room where Captain Himayun Khan's picture and uh, all the wonderful memories that uh, he left us with are placed. And Ghazala and I spoke several times during those two days. So second day, we almost decided that we will not uh, ruin our privacy, our peace, and we will decline. I go to check the mail that second day afternoon, and uh, in the mailbox with other mail, there is a white small envelope with no stamp on it, our name only. Uh, out of curiosity, I open it standing right there, and uh, immediately I recognize the name of the middle school because I have spoken to these kids privately, personally, and heartened them. Uh, Four children, I did not recognize the name, have written that card. And this is the line that sent us to that convention. And uh, uh, that particular card, and then there is another letter that we have received among thousands of letters that have come in after speaking at the convention. But anyway, so I read that card, and, uh, and this is what that line said. This was written by four middle school students and says, Mr. and Mrs. Khan, would you make sure that Maria is not thrown out of this country? She's our friend. We love her. I looked at that card twice. Inside the home, we had been praying that some guidance should come our way somewhere so that we make the right decision. We were torn. We didn't want to go because of our peace, our uh, privacy. Uh, we did want to say something about, about worried kids and children, how they have taken that threat. I brought that card immediately to Azala, and I showed it to her that, uh, look what has come in the mail. She looks at it. I'm standing next to her, and eyes welled. She looks at me. She said, we should go. Call them. We will go. So I picked up the phone and I told uh, DNC folks that we will come. So we were told that you have two minutes. Whatever you wish to say, make sure time is very tight and, uh, and uh, uh, you're welcome. Uh, you will be part of the Thursday's uh, lineup and uh, two minutes and uh, you have to submit the outline, what you wish to say, that is the protocol. So I sat down to write my grievances. One page, two page, it was <laughs> almost 12 pages, two minutes. And uh, so next morning, uh, overnight, I wrote all nonsense that was bothering me and uh, about my observation, worried children. So next morning, I said, Ghazala, my speech is ready. Would you sit and listen and see if I can finish it in two minutes? So she sat down. She sat down with the clock in her hand. And I remember I began to read uh, first page, two page, third page, fifth page. And it was two minutes, and then five minutes, and then seven minutes. And it went all the way to 18 minutes. And she said, you only have two minutes. Let's cut it down. And uh, uh, the very first line that I wrote, and uh, bless her heart, Ghazala always had been my editor of my life. And, uh, and that moment, my first line of that speech that I wrote was this, that she scratched it immediately. Uh, the first line was, these are my words. I have not plagiarized them from Mrs. Obama's speech. <laughs> So she, she interrupted me. She shook her hand and she got the pen. She said, no, this is not, uh, you're not going to say that. Uh, this is not, uh, uh, the moment is so dignified 
that this will not be appropriate, and then we begin to narrow it down. And I called uh, some folks that are more uh, uh, familiar with such uh, events. They said, if you have two minutes, you should limit your speech to 260 words. 130 words per minute is recommendation of experts. So we narrowed it down as much as we could uh, because we had to submit our, our uh, comments because that's the protocol to DNC. So that's why we went there reluctant, not knowing what lies ahead. But it was uh, uh, in care of our small children. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, you spoke, and Mrs. Ghazala Khan stood by you. And when that happened, there was a tweet out there that said, if you look at his wife, she was standing there. She had nothing to say. Maybe she wasn't allowed to have anything to say. You tell me. Yeah. Um, she had answered that question um, several times in public and in op-ed in Washington Post as well. But this is the height of ignorance. Uh, only those parents would know the sentiment uh, who have lost child. Uh, what she was going through, because prior to even going to convention, I asked her, would you at least uh, come up when we go to the podium, would you say, thank you for inviting us, honoring our son, and my husband will speak? Uh, and she said, no, I cannot. And, and I had known her to fall apart whenever there had been at other occasions picture of Captain Himayun Khan on the screen or on display. She just cannot keep her composure. Uh, so she said uh, it will be, uh, the event will be so indignified if I spoke and I fell apart and I started to sob or cry. The whole attention will be on, on, on me, so do not insist that I speak. So I said, all right, then you just stand and hold the podium so you remain standing. And you will see if you pay attention to it, she's holding the podium very tight. And uh, my entire focus beside the speech is her well-being, because she, is, she has very high blood pressure at that moment. And I'm fully aware why is she feeling, because Captain Himayun Khan's picture and the tribute that was paid to him, she heard all of that uh, standing behind in the green room before we came up to the stage. So it was that that uh, Razala did not speak. Um, and uh, she said so clearly that uh, lack of empathy, not realizing what a mother is going through at this moment when her son is being remembered in front of the public. Uh, but, uh, uh, but here we are. Well, thank you for your courage and her courage. It, it took a lot to do something like that. So thank you. When you pulled out the Constitution of the United States out of your pocket, and by the way, just, just in your honor, Mr. Khan, look what I have in my pocket. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> One would think that you started your interest, almost your love, uh, for the US Constitution when you came to the United States. No, no, no. We tell that story in the book in great detail, uh, and you will enjoy that part. I fell in love with the Constitution in 1972. This love affair started then when I was second year law student. I was 22 year old. I had taken a course in world constitution, com comparative study of world constitutions. Constitution of USSR, yes, some of you remember, it used to be USSR, which is Russia now. Uh, Constitution of Germany, Magna Carta, which is at the foundation of the British legal system, and then the Constitution of the United States. The very first page on top of these printed material, there was no book available at that time, so instructor has put together the reading materials. The very first page the very first line of the very first page of these materials said, Declaration of 
independence. And I looked at it when I placed the materials on the metal desk of my dorm room uh, desk, um, and my glance fell over that first page and the word Declaration of Independence. Something uh, uh, seemed so amazing that this nation is declaring their independence. I come from the part of the world we were colonized as well. We debated, we argued, we protested, and when there was nothing left for king or queen to take from the nation, we were given independence. And that's the history of decolonization, that independence is given. No one dares to declare their independence. Wow, what a nation. Uh, so I read the entire Declaration of Independence. This is 1972, in awe. I only understood half of it because it is written in, uh, in little difficult English for me then and even now. Uh, but I read it in first standing, and I tell that story in the book that I took my shoes off, my feet began to hurt as I was reading it, uh, all 1,338 words of Declaration of Independence I read standing there and uh, it was afternoon and sun was going down and I could see the shadow of it going down. Uh, and I wanted to hurry up and read it uh, in awe of the spirit of this nation. And that awe of declaring its independence has not uh, diminished. It is even heightened. After reading the Declaration of Independence, next morning I had a friend who was uh, a uh, postgraduate student of English literature, I asked him, have you read the US Constitution's Declaration of Independence part? And he said, no. So I showed it to him, and he read it, and he explained some terms and some of the language that I did not understand to me. And we were in awe for days. We will talk about that. Why did not rest of the world declare its independence from colonized from the colonized life and colonized part of uh, uh, the history. Yet, America figured it out. These people figured it out in 1774. It took a few years. Thomas Jefferson, now I know several others come together, wrote the declaration. Uh, and uh, uh, in 1776, they are declaring their independence. We waited till 1947, 1950, and thereafter to gain our independence. Um, amazing, at that time in 1972, I did not have the caliber or the courage or, the, or even uh, ability to dream that maybe one day I could go and visit this great nation, these great people that have declared their independence. It made amazing sense that reading the Declaration of Independence, then reading the articles. That's how civilized people live, the relationship between states and the federal government, rule of law, uh, judges, courts, all of that is enshrined in our articles. And then came the best part when I read, and that was second day. I'm so fascinated with it. I read the Bill of Rights. I was so amazed at uh, the wording of the Bill of Rights. I, uh, for several days, that uh, amazing awe that I was after reading Declaration, then coming to the First Amendment. And I, even today, I, I uh, uh, implore and I appeal to, the, uh, to all Americans, especially to my uh, uh, friends that uh, uh, are native born of America that read these three documents. And when you come to the First Amendment, when you come to those dignities that are enshrined in our Bill of Rights, the first five words will tell you the exceptional uh, status and mentality and position of this nation. The first five words of the First Amendment say, Congress shall make no laws. And then it talks about freedom of speech and freedom of press and uh, uh, freedom of religion or its practice and all of that. But those five words have meant so very much of the mentality of this nation. And then I 
few years ago, I conducted a study at my own out of curiosity. I read the constitution which were available in printed form of the rest of the world, especially the uh, Western world. There is no other constitution. Most constitutions start like this. The parliament, the general assembly, the uh, legislative body of this nation can legislate this, 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 or whatever it decides in the benefit of the nation and all of this, except the United States. And that is why these dignities are so important for this nation, for my nation, for my country, to remember that our forefathers had the wisdom to put those five words, Congress shall make no law, meaning the legislative body, the supreme legislative body of this nation is prohibited from touching these privileges that are enshrined. Among them, the very first one is freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of faith, practicing faith or not practicing faith or any faith, and the rest. Uh, meaning that uh, even the most prestigious, uh, highest legislative institute institution of this nation cannot touch these privileges that are enshrined. And uh, I am just uh, uh, amazed at so humble and so grateful. People ask me why this you speak so passionately about the Constitution, about uh, Bill of Rights and all, because I have lived twice in my life under authoritarian system. I have lived when only martial law administrator can give me permission to come out of the home or speak or read the newspaper. Uh, I, I have seen with my own eyes the newspaper reporters being beaten, shot, uh, press, the newspaper printing press, burn them, they are no good, they publish uh, falsehood, uh, uh, they should not be allowed to uh, uh, spread the, the, the wrong news, the, what we call today the fake news. Uh, and uh, so I have seen with my own eyes what extreme can do, what authoritarians like. The very first thing they don't like is, uh, is uh, uh, free press, because free press criticizes them. Second thing they don't like, these judges are no good. They, uh, I will decide as a martial law administrator, as the dictator of this country, as the dear leader, I will decide what is good for this nation. Who are these judges to tell me, uh, follow the rule of law? So two things they don't like. One is the freedom of press. Second is the rule of law. And you draw the conclusions or connect the dots uh, to today, but that was my background. So reading all these privileges that are enshrined, why wouldn't I be so proudly passionate about these? Why wouldn't I remind all of us, let's read them again. Uh, sorry to give you this such a long answer, but uh, Captain Himayun Khan, uh, our son, wrote an article. It is so relevant today, Sumaya. Uh, he was uh, gaining admission. After he was admitted to uh, to University of Virginia, there is a dormitory called uh, Hereford College. Uh, he wanted to live there, so they had asked all applicants to write an article. And we tell all of these stories in the book in great detail. He wrote an article to gain admission, and the title of that article was Democracy Requires Vigilance and Sacrifice. And look where we are today. Our democracy requires vigilance. And somebody asked me, I come from Virginia. And on last Tuesday, Virginia participated in making democracy strong. And so people ask me at every event I have spoken to, as I was sharing with you, to about 168 events throughout the nation. And the journey of hope continues. And at the end, they all ask, where do we go from here? And this is what my humble suggestion is. Let's participate in our democracy. Let's make sure that we are fully aware of the perils that lie ahead, the difficulty that our democracy faces, not only ours, but throughout the world. 
democracies are challenged by authoritarians and uh, they want to malign democracy, democratic system of government. Self-governing concept is foreign to them. They don't like the people that govern ourselves. We decide who will lead us. We make mistakes sometimes in electing the leaders like we did last election, but then we correct it. Then we fix it. Next time around, we correct, correct it by selecting the right leader for us, and we decide what laws will govern us. So it is that story that we have narrated in the book, and, uh, and I have continued to speak, and I will continue to speak, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, after speaking when we went home, we were thinking that uh, uh, it will be a back to our peace and quiet and all that, but that was not the case. Invitations came and came cards and letters, letters of encouragement, some bad letters as well, but uh, most of them, majority of them were good, heartening, uh, telling us thank you for reminding us uh, of our values, of our constitution. That waving of the constitution was a symbol to remind ourselves that we live under rule of law. We live under some universal truths, meaning that Everyone is created with equal dignity by our creator. So it was that gesture that appealed to America, and we received thousands of letters. In, among those thousands of letters, we have kept them so that one day we will reply and respond to everyone that encouraged us. One letter came, 26 pages, this retired army nurse wrote. In 25 pages, she writes the story of what took place in Germany prior to Second World War. She served there as an army nurse. She's retired now, elderly. So she narrated the, her story in 25 pages. On 26th page, she tells us, she said, and I have saved it, and I never hesitate to share that 26th page of her letter to us. She said, Mr. Khan, continue to speak continue to speak. Had more people spoken prior to Second World War, the atrocities that were committed could have been avoided. The atrocities against our Jewish brothers and sisters that were committed in Second World War could have been avoided if more people would have spoken. The atrocities against the mankind could have been avoided. Do not stop speaking. So it is such messages that encourage me, that has made me to continue to speak, and uh, here we sit uh, before so Atlanta. Happy. We're so happy you're speaking. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. I want to take you back to the book. What got you to write a book, and why the title, An American <laughs> Family? And I have to tell you, the book is very engaging. It, it just tells the story of my parents as well. My parents immigrated here uh, from Egypt. And you know, through this reading it, it resonated with me, and I'm sure it's going to resonate with so many people. So why the title and why the book? Um, it, was, it was given to us. We did not think of a few months after that. We were just going place to place, speaking whoever would invite, uh, out of gratitude to tell America how grateful we are because uh, first I tell you the, uh, my experience of becoming US citizen. And I implore every American to read the, uh, the oath of citizenship that uh, immigrants take, one that I took. It's available and anyone can read it. Uh, that uh, moment uh, remains so alive in my, in my conscious. Uh, I am to go to the federal courtroom to take the oath of citizenship. I parked my car and I went up the stairs to this courtroom, it's on second floor, and I paused outside the courtroom because I wanted to recount the indignities that I had gone through, that I could not step out to speak, I could not read the newspaper, 
that to buy a bag of rice, I had to have permission. To buy a bag of sugar, I had to have Russian card. All those indignities, uh, I thought of them, what is about to take place in my life. So I, after realizing all the indignities that I had gone through my entire life is about to change, I walk into the courtroom and there's a wonderful ceremony. There are lots of people in becoming citizen. I became citizen among them. And we are given a green certificate. Its, uh, its color is, is green ink. And on the top of that, uh, uh, it says Certificate of Naturalization and Citizenship. Um, when I looked at that certificate, and that is what had been life uh, since then, living in this blessed country, uh, to me, those words did not read uh, certificate of citizenship. To me, those words read, and I was very much fully aware of what has taken place. To me, those words read certificate of dignities. Yeah. That is what took place that moment when I became citizen, that I became a dignified human being as my creator has created me. And it's only this blessed nation that gave me that status, that gives all of us that status. It is that reason, it's not the military might, it's not the economic might that makes this nation as nation of, nation for, as beacon of hope for the rest of the world. Because of these dignities, because of these ideals, because of these principles that this nation is founded, sometimes people ask that the way you speak it begins to seem like that this is the perfect place on planet Earth. No, no, there is so much room to make it better. There is so much room to have the equal dignity in all aspects, the equality in all aspects, but this is the best place. Comparatively speaking, the rest of the world, this is the best place where basic dignities are guaranteed. We can make them better. Uh, and a scholar has said that these rights may be inalienable, but these are not self-executory. We make them self-executory. We make them executory. Therefore, standing for these rights, speaking of these rights, showing to ourselves and the rest of the world. So coming back to the book, uh, this idea was given, Razala and I were changing gates at Charlotte Airport. And uh, a couple approached us, Mr. and Mrs. Khan, uh, hello, thank you, and greeted us very warmly. We are standing in, 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 in hallway. People are walking, trying to catch their flights. Uh, and they begin to ask us question, when did you come here? Uh, what brought you here? And uh, uh, where are other children? And, and all sorts of questions within uh, a minute of standing there. And then I, we try to be polite and humble and we are answering their question. Then comes someone else recognized and they wanted to shake hand and all that. And we thought we should hurry up and move to our gate. Uh, so as a departing gesture, they said, have you thought of writing a book answering all these questions that people are asking you? <laughs> So we came back home and we spoke that maybe this is the time because so many people are asking the same question again and again. So uh, that's where the idea came from. Thank you for your answer. And, uh, and the title, American Family, uh, is a tribute to, to the spirit of America that uh, uh, we say it's a misnomer when we say this is nation of immigrants. No, no, no. This is nation of spirit of immigrants. What is the spirit of immigrants? Spirit of immigrants is that we want to make our life better. We want to make the life of our community better, our generation better, and we wind up making life of our nation better. So it is that that uh, all immigrants, it's on behalf of all immigrants, a spirit of immigration that uh, wishes to make life better. And uh, so that's where uh, the title comes from. In your hometown of Charlottesville, August of 2017, 
the Unite the White rally uh, took place in Charlottesville, where 32-year-old Heather Heyer was killed. This showed us how polarized our country is. How do we fix that polarization? Do you have a magic wand? Yes, yes. I'll, I'll share with you the magic wand in a second. But I was there. I come from Charlottesville, Virginia. Yes, Thomas Jefferson City. Uh, blessed uh, home to, to University of Virginia. By the way, the proceeds of this book, and there is another book that we have written for our middle school students uh, titled, This is Our Constitution. Uh, proceeds of this book go to uh, a scholarship that has already been endowed and funded, uh, titled Captain Himayun Khan Memorial Scholarship uh, on need-based in perpetuity. So some good continues to come out of this effort. Uh, I was there on uh, Friday. It was Friday evening. It was 12th of August of this year when uh, 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 I saw with my own eyes the scene that I uh, would never forget and I was not expecting that I will see in America. And that scene was that there was March. I had ordered some books. I was going to pick, it, pick up the books and I avoided the entire area of the courthouse and the downtown. I drove through the medical center. The traffic was blocked and I wondered why there may be some accident or something. So. I parked the car and I saw other people uh, standing outside and I rolled the window down and I heard the chants. And I was curious so I came out uh, of the car and I heard the chants and I saw this march that was taking place from that street to McIntyre Boulevard to University of Virginia's uh, sacred ground. Uh, and I heard the chants and I saw the march, and then I saw something that I thought I would never see, and I will never forget that moment, was a Nazi flag that was being carried. And you have seen probably on, on, on news media and all that. And I thought to myself that this flag was defeated by brave sons and daughters of this nation, my sons and daughters that sacrificed their life in Europe we buried it there that this hateful flag will never be rising again. In some of the countries, it's a crime to have that flag. Look at the liberty, look at the level of freedom here that that flag was being waved and the chants that uh, were being chanted. And uh, uh, I was, I looked at the people that were standing outside their car, the concern on their faces because every marcher had a rifle and then multiple guns around their waist. Uh, peaceful community of Charlottesville uh, was afraid, was scared. And I saw the faces of the people that were standing, children. I was uh, uh, so, so afraid, I sat down in my car and I rolled the window up uh, because of my safety. Uh, but that, then, then the next day, Saturday, was when my daughter, I call her my daughter out of affection, Heather Hare was murdered by, the, by, the, by a car driver that had come from somewhere else and to participate in that uh, uh, expression of hate speech. But then Thursday, uh, Wednesday night, was that is where the magic wand comes to display. Uh, Charlottesville decided that we will dispel this ugliness, this un-American expression of hate and, and uh, threat and uh, uh, violence uh, that was displayed by these marchers. Freedom of speech is understandable. I, I stand for that, but not at the cost of assaulting the peaceful community, making their families and children and peaceful citizen afraid of their safety, that is, not, uh, uh, that is not freedom of expression or freedom of speech. Um, so on Wednesday, the community decided this was through emails and through messages, the entire Charlottesville showed up. 
at the sacred grounds of the University of Virginia. They brought small children. They brought families with candles. And they marched to repel all the hateful display of this ugliness in Charlottesville. Um, so that's where lies the magic wand to dispel this un-American divisiveness and hate is communities coming together, uh, people realizing what our values are, what our foundational values are, uh, people coming together, families, children. I went to Boston to speak, and I paid tribute to the Bostonian. You must have seen there were about a dozen or so uh, people came to display hate and division. But then 45,000 Bostonians came out the next day to repel all of that. That is the magic wand, that communities have the power. Communities have this authority. Communities have this, uh, uh, this uh, power to display, to repel this, uh, this hateful uh, display. Um, we're going to take a couple questions from the audience. I uh, want to ask you, if you do want to ask a question, to come up to the mic. I think we have two right there. And if you would make your questions, uh, please, as short as possible, so we can get as many questions uh, as uh, we can this evening, uh, answered by Mr. Khan. That's a great opportunity to ask Mr. Khan questions. Any, any questions? Could, could, can you come up to the microphone, please? Hi, thank you for speaking, um, it was excellent. So you've mentioned um, something that I think is very representative of my parents' generation that similar to you immigrated to this country and became naturalized citizens, which is kind of affection for the Constitution and the ideals of the United States. But in our generation growing up, we sometimes feel as what's represented as foreigners in our own country. We don't feel like this country is necessarily for us. And especially now with seeing a lot of the sort of inequalities coming out in the media, it definitely presents itself. So how do we kind of take back the feeling of feeling like America is our country and it is for us? Well, thank you for asking that question. I, uh, I humbly submit that rights are not given on a plate. You claim your rights. Remember, the spirit of this nation is we declared our independence. Independence wasn't given to us. So that's the, that's the guiding principle that you claim your, your, your right. That is one. Second, this division that you feel, this economic division that has been diverted towards immigrants, it's such a falsehood. I, I give you, and I'll take a minute to explain this uh, so that you can, you can reflect on this. These are the numbers given to us. This, economic division that exists. Oh, these immigrants take our jobs. They uh, are taking our, our future. They are destroying our, our economic well-being. The last two world wars were fought on that, script, on that script. First, economic well-being. Second, nationalism. Third, fear of immigrant. This is nothing new. This had existed, which gave us First World War, same thing, Second World War, and here we are again. This exploitation of economic well-being is an old script that most smart people sitting here fully recognize. These are the numbers. There are 7 million young Americans unemployed today, 7 million. And you talk to the technology leaders, they will tell you there are 6.2 million jobs that they cannot find qualified people to fill. That inability to train our youth to fill those jobs so that they will have better future, it is a political stunt that some of our political leaders exploit to create division. This time around, those who do not like our way of life, those who have had the grudge of disintegration of Soviet Union in their hearts, they have gotten hold of this issue. How could we 
create this fear of immigrants in the hearts of Americans so that this division will be further deeper and would begin to harm the nation. Instead of our political leaders, our thoughtful uh, uh, scholars focusing on how could we train these seven million unemployed Americans to have the jobs that technology sector, 6.2 million jobs that exist, that is where we need to bring people from outside to fill. Why don't we have an apprenticeship program nationwide for technology positions, for technology jobs, for all of our youth? Our community college should be an assembly ground training for technology. That's where the future is. That's where the jobs are. That is when these technology companies go and recruit and bring people from outside, people from other countries, because we have not resolved that basic issue. It is that economic division that is being exploited. But once we begin to speak about it and we show that immigrants are 30% of the Nobel laureates of this nation are first generation immigrants. What an honor immigrants bring. What a contribution immigrants bring to make the nation vital. I, uh, I wish to, to read uh, part of the Declaration of Independence. I keep, whenever there is mention of immigration in our conversation, uh, there are 18 grievances listed in our Declaration of Independence. Grievance number seven, and I read it, it's only two lines, and it says, he has endeavored, he meaning the king, has endeavored to prevent the population of the United States for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, meaning we griped then that there should be immigration, of course, regulated and with laws and with the proper procedures, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration here meaning that even forefathers knew what reasonable immigration properly under some policy, under some uh, proper planning, what immigration can do to vitalize the economy and the country. It's out of ignorance and the mere exploitation uh, of this sentiment of economic well-being. But it is, it, is, it is facade. It's based on ignorance, the more educated we become about these issues, the less fearful we are, the more we embrace one another and uh, we continue to move forward. So I want you to be heartened and this is our country. We are responsible for its safety, for its security, for its well-being and we shall make sure that, uh, that this, uh, this uh, fabricated fear of immigrants exists no more. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Khan and Sumeya. Assalamu alaikum. Um, you bring a lot of positivity here, and I've uh, been observing. I'd like to issue you a small little challenge for you, something to consider. Um, I really think you should consider running for an elected position. <laughs> I really do. I mean, Washington, D.C. would benefit so much. So I, I really do think you should really, you live in a very wonderful state. I lived in Virginia for seven years. Two of my daughters were born there. Um, I really think you should seriously give consideration to uh, uh, running for a position in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Khan. Thank you for coming to Atlanta. Um, I'm a kindergarten teacher in a very diverse part of Atlanta, and I'm very proud to have a classroom full of first-generation American children. And you can imagine I have a lot of stories, and yesterday's <coughs> story was that a, another <coughs> father of mine was detained and will likely be deported. And it's gut-wrenching to teach these small children about equality and patriotism and justice. And I feel like your answer is going to be, just keep doing it, Hannah. But um, I, I want to know what you are telling our smallest children. Yeah. We. Um, as people of today. Uh, first, 
Our time has placed us in this moment, in this moment of difficulty, each one of us. Our time has placed us. And we have two choices. One is to go back home in Charlottesville, get back to your private life, peace and quiet, and, uh, and live hereafter. Or set the sail. The wind is on your back. Set the sail. Continue to move forward. Yes, there are going to be moments of turbulence. There are going to be moments of difficulty, moments when the wind will not be supporting you. It rather will be against you. But you must set the sail. That is the call of our time. Whatever station we are, whatever station our time has placed us, there comes time, believe me, sometime people uh, uh, are reluctant, as I had been reluctant to imagine, reluctant to, to see beyond stars. The work that you're doing, when you walk into from tomorrow onward, there is sacredness to face those little souls that have been given under your custody. It just didn't happen. Sometimes we, we, uh, we think that it is by accidents or incidents that I am here. Not at all. There is a purpose to that. You have been placed there by our Creator to look after those little souls, those disheartened children. And in the book I say, maybe that was especially for you, I say, so what if you're thirsty? Be river for others. Sometime we make those decisions every day. There is this moment in your life that you have been made custodian of the well-being of these small children. This is an amazing sacredness to it. And uh, uh, so what if you're thirsty? Be river for others. Thank you. Mr. Khan, it's an honor to be here uh, with you today. I wanted to just share with you, um, my name is Soon Mi Kim, and last year, um, starting last summer, I was so angry, I was livid, and I couldn't figure out why, um, as you were being attacked by our current president, what was making me so crazy. And I realized that um, you and your pocket constitution was actually a reminder of my late father. And the, my name, my name, um, student me, the me and my name actually stands for America. And your ideals and um, your, your spirit reminds me so much of him, so I wanted to thank you for that. You. Um, up until um, that time when you were, um, you entered the, the national stage, I had always kind of hyphenated my Americanness. I was always Korean American. Asian American, some type of hyphenated American. And certainly that part of that is a, uh, a nod to my past, but it was also a recognition that maybe I'm not fully American, that I had to qualify that. You changed that for me. Mm -hmm. And because of you, I choose how I um, express myself and identify myself based on my own terms. And I love that the name of your book is um, An American family. And anyway, just wanted to say thank you for uh, your family, your sacrifice, and everything that you represent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really, all these stories are tribute to the greatness of this nation. It is that that we have tried to indirectly pay our tribute to the goodness of this land, this blessed land. This is the only land on this planet Earth where these dignities are enshrined. I wish every American would be so proud of these values that it bestows upon the mankind, upon human being, brings a, a person without any di in, in these dignities to a, a level of uh, humanness which our Creator had intended for all of us to have. Some have it and some don't. And we are so blessed to have these dignities and honored. So I pay tribute to your parent and to your family. And yes, we are part of this blessed nation. And we shall remain part of this blessed nation. Thank you. 
I wrote to President um, Trump. I said I was finishing my master's when he was finishing his undergraduate. And I have lived and worked here as an American. I have traveled to 30 different countries where I've been received and respected as an American. And I said, but I'm also a Muslim. You don't like us Muslims, so I pack my bags. As a fellow alumnus, can you tell me where I should go? And when, when should I go? But I haven't heard from him. Every time the doorbell rings, my daughter asks me, is your bag still packed? The Secret Service is looking for you. How no, no. do I get him to see this point of view that I'm as much of an American as he is? Yes, that is, that is, that is so true. But no, I, 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 I respectfully disagree with this thinking that we should pack bags or we should go elsewhere. And not at all. Um, uh, I have seen the, the acceptance of this nation of all of us, be it Muslims or Christians or Jews or faith or no faith, uh, uh, whoever has come here. I remember listening to Reagan's last farewell speech, and I implore everyone to listen to it if you have a chance, where he says that this nation, the dream of this nation that he has, the, 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 the image of this nation he has is that shining city on hill that has walls, but that those walls have doors in them. Anyone with the courage and heart can enter those doors. It is that, that this nation, once you're here, when you have become a, a fully participating, engaged member of the community, member of this nation, no other nation on this planet, I challenge you, you show me which other nation accepts people from all over the world and grants them equal dignity and equal protection of law, except the United States. So this anomaly that has taken place to which you are referring, this is an anomaly. It happened not only, it is, it is uh, collaborators of Russia got involved in this and uh, the internal divisiveness. I blame myself to some extent that we were not speaking as loudly, all of us, as we could have been. We were not participating in the political process as we all could have been. Look, Virginia participated. On Tuesday, Virginia participated. My daughters and my sisters stood in the rain, and they said, we will not move up until we vote. And look, the difference that this participation made. Uh, and I implore, regardless of what political affiliation you may have, democracy is stronger when we all participate in it. If these values are so, uh, so dear to us, so valuable to us, we must stand for these values so that the rest of the world knows. Look what is happening in Brexit. Look what I was, I went there, they invited me to come and speak, and I told them that you have been exploited, you have been misled. Some of them knew then. Everyone knows now that how Russia interfered in that referendum as well. Same thing happened on the day of election or prior to then, how those who do not wish us well wanted to malign our system of government, wanted to malign the credibility of our elections. To some extent, they were almost successful. So this anomaly uh, they, we have celebrated 230 years of our Constitution. Uh, we have seen very difficult moments. Uh, some of the rights that we take for granted and we cherish as minorities would have not been possible without the sacrifices of our civil rights leaders. Look the difficulties that they had gone through to make sure that we all can get up and vote and have equal dignity and have equal participation and all that. So let's celebrate that. This entire nation, Portland, Oregon, to, uh, to uh, Dallas, to Houston, Corpus Christi, uh, Toledo, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Detroit, uh, Minnesota, entire nation is of the sentiment that how could we fix this so it doesn't happen again. When so many people, when the majority of this nation is in full recognition of 
that non-participation is not a choice. We shall participate at every station. We shall participate. I see brighter future. I see that, uh, that this moment of difficulty is short-lived. We, uh, we shall prevail. America shall prevail. America's goodness will prevail. Two questions. Yeah, let's do the last two. Yeah, that was the last it was first, so go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Thank you. You're welcome. In my family, we thought that we might have some Choctaw blood. I might have been an eighth Choctaw. So when I got my DNA kit, I was very eager to do the swab and send it off. Well, I'm 97% European and 3% Middle Eastern. So my parts are not of this country. Uh, my parts came over, uh, par, uh, parts of me came over as early as 1629 and as late as 18, uh, 1864. But I'm here and I'm an American, very proud to be an American and such. And the thing is, my parts arrived earlier than you did. But I'm glad you're here. Thank you. 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 Uh, Mr. Khan, I'm a school board member in DeKalb County, Georgia, which has one of our largest immigrant and refugee populations in the state. And so we deal with a lot of these issues. And in fact, our superintendent has stood up very uh, forcefully for this population and has been attacked in certain quarters in the state. But one of the things that's caught me in what you've said, which is really a, a, a dissertation really on our civic engagement and our notion of civics, and I think a lot of our native population, quite frankly, as opposed to our immigrant population, has lost sight of some of those values. I think we've lost sight about the importance about that engagement, about how our country runs, about the precepts of our Constitution. And I think what you've said tonight for me as a, again, as a, as a parent and as a school board member really reinforces that we need to reinforce those concepts for our children. I think we take them for granted or we worry about uncomfortable conversations about how our democracy works and sometimes doesn't work as well as we expect. And the appreciation you've been able to express, I think, is a good message for everyone here about how it is important for our children, whether they've come here more recently or they were here for generations, uh, to understand that the, the importance, the uniqueness, and the somewhat the fragility of the, dis, the democratic system we have and the, the need for our children to fully understand how it operates, sure. to find a pathway to engagement, and by, through that engagement to reinforce those basic notions that you've talked about this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just to, thank you. I am, I am just one brief footnote to uh, uh, what was said. Uh, I'm so honored. Uh, the, the main character of uh, democratic people is civility, civility in all discourse. And that is what our message to our future generation is that one thing we shall never forget, and that is that as democratic people, we conduct ourselves with civility. We may disagree with everyone and anyone, but we conduct ourselves with civility. And uh, so I, I am so glad that you came to join us. Thank you. And I'll take the privilege of the, the last question. Your call to action, we have seen you have demonstrated what your personal call to action is, of speaking out, of delivering a message. What is the call to action to the American people? Well, I, I uh, have alluded to it, uh, but to be very specific, I was in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Half of the hall was full of veterans, men and women that have served this nation and they asked me this question, Mr. Khan. We know that we did not vote for the candidate that you were supporting. Uh, one of the ladies stood up and she lifted her sleeve and she said, Mr. Khan, do you see these marks? These are my dialysis marks. Mr. Khan, would you make sure that my health care is uh, preserved? I am so worried 
that I don't sleep well because I'm worried that my health care will be taken. Some other veterans stood up and said, we were promised there will be better employment, there will be better wages. Where do we go? We have buyer's remorse. What do we do now? <laughs> and that is how I answered to them. That Pick up your phone tomorrow. Call your congressman, call your senator, that you want to hear from them. You want to hear not addressing you, but in the Congress, in public, defending our rights, defending our dignities, defending our, uh, the promises that were made to us. And if you do not do that, not only I will never contribute, I will never vote for you. I will vote for those who will represent us. So, and they did. Later on, uh, somebody sent me an email telling that uh, they received such a positive response from their senators, from their congressmen, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully things will uh, get better. Uh, what I meant to say was that in democracy, participation is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, those who do not wish us well begin to find an opportunity that, oh, these people don't participate in this. So it's only little communities that we can infiltrate and we can misguide them, we can mislead them and accomplish our, our, our goal of harming this society and this nation and democracy throughout the world. Therefore, all of us as beneficiaries of the democratic system, we must participate. We must on 7th of November is such a such a sacred day in the life of democratic people that all of us must vote. Take our time, take a couple of hours, few hours. So what if it is raining? Take umbrella. If it is cold, put on another coat on and participate. And there is, there is our creator's bestowed opportunity to show your gratitude for the dignities that are enshrined in this democratic system. We will not like it what is on the other side. We wouldn't like an authoritarian running this country, deciding on our behalf what rights we will have, we will not have, and all that. We will not like that. Therefore, to be grateful for what we have, we must participate. It is that simple. Some of us can make a group, raise our voice, assemble, unite, uh, uh, make a platform, assemble more people, talk to those who are still unwilling. That is what I say to immigrants. You should be the most active politically participant community of this nation because you are the direct first generation beneficiary of the privileges and the dignities that this nation places upon its citizens. Therefore, my humble request to every community had been remain united, faithful. This anomaly will be over soon, but let's participate at every level from every platform. Let's participate. Please join me in thanking Kizer Khan and Samaya Kalejra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.